The German naval raid on Hartlepool took place on Wednesday, the 16th of December, 1914. This was the only time that Britain's coast defences were involved in protecting the country from a hostile seaborne force. The bombardment of Hartlepool was Britain's only classic engagement between battleship and battery. The attack on Hartlepool took 40 minutes, between 8.10 and 8.15 a.m. In total, German warships fired 1,150 shells into Hartlepool. The Hartlepool battery returned 125 shells. 127 people were killed, including soldiers. 400 people were wounded. John Southcott and his team of volunteers are committed to ensuring that the gun battery is restored to its former glory. The preservation of such an important historical landmark is important to the town and its place in history. Funding for the restoration projects at the gun battery site have been sourced through the English Heritage and the National Lottery Fund. Local engineering company Herrimer are responsible for the painstaking restoration of the guns. Local man Gary Kester is a bit of a big gun himself when it comes to local history. Here's Gary to tell us more about the Hoof Gun Battery Trust and its function. We're essentially living historians who um, work on the battery and go to local events and schools dressed in uniform and carrying the equipment of soldiers and airmen of the First and Second World Wars, ostensibly just to give um, children and, and people we talk to an idea of what it was like uh, for life in the services during those periods. Um, it's a lot more effective than, say, showing them a picture or a book um, saying, oh, look at the equipment on that guy's back, it weighed so-and-so. If you just put the equipment directly on their back, they have an exact idea of what it felt like. Um, at the moment, we're standing in barbet number two on the Huff gun battery. Essentially, it's a fancy word for gun pit, and this one was installed during the Second World War, um, or rather, it was here in the First World War, but this one was widened in the Second World War um, to could take anti-aircraft guns, because during the First World War, the threat of anti-aircraft -air attacks was very, very narrow. The gun pits are in a, um, were originally filled with earth when the battery was decommissioned, and volunteers from the Yuff Gun Battery Trust hand-dug them out, and as you can see, they're now very close to restoration and during the course of the next year guns are going to be restored back into them so that when visitors come to the battery they'll actually be able to see the weapons in place rather than just dry concrete. This wall and the, and the camouflage was one of the first stages of the restoration of the battery which as you can see is now complete. Um, the rest of the battery and its guns are going to be following so shortly. This weapon here is a Lanchester Mark I, which was a submachine gun designed for the RAF in 1940. Um, the reasoning was, at the height of the Battle of Britain, they were worried that the Germans would deploy paratroopers onto Allied airfields, and so they developed a submachine gun that could be used to guard aerodromes. Um, it's actually more or less a copy of a German weapon called the MP28 um, that the British had admired for a while. It's a simple weapon. Basically, you fit in a 50-round magazine, which would hold 50 rounds of 9mm pistol ammunition. Cock the weapon, and it fires from what's called an open bolt. As the bolt goes forward, it puts the first round in the barrel, the recoil from the barrel, drops this back again, and as long as you hold the trigger down, the weapon will keep firing. Roughly 500 rounds a minute would be its cyclic rate. It also has a mount for a British Army bayonet, um, which, as you can see, is quite a ferocious-looking weapon. Um, it's 24 inches long, more or less, um, when the threat of the invasion after the Battle of Britain passed, the RAF didn't really have any use for these anymore, so most of them went to the Royal Navy, who would use them to board German ships. It found extreme success in the hands of the Royal Navy, because if you imagine a British sailor comes on board your ship, shouts, hand a hawk, and suddenly you're looking down a blade and a submachine gun capable of firing 50 rounds in as many, um, in as many times, you know, I can literally do that, and that would be the that would be the rounds expended. Um, it was an exceptionally well-made weapon. It had a wooden stock, it had brass fittings, and it was very expensive. Um, and the famous Sten gun, which um, was issued to British troops later on in the war, was actually just this, with every expensive piece of it um, was stripped away. So the Lanchester is a bit of an oddity, um, but a very nice weapon. This is the British Army Sten gun, which replaced the Manchester, uh, sorry, the Lanchester. This is a Mark III Sten. Um, essentially, every 
expensive and well-machined component of the Lanchester was stripped away. This is made of metal stampings, rough weldings. Um, it's a very cheap and um, cheerful weapon that was issued in vast numbers. And towards the end of the war, they were even being made by bicycle makers. They were that easy to make. Incredibly inaccurate, but very, very easy to make.